It is January 28, 2017. I'm Israel Anderson, and we need to talk. Please like, share, and comment on these for me. I'm going to be live streaming these now, as you can see from this one, although I've got covered up my screen so that I don't get distracted by everything. Uh, but if you're on my Facebook page, you may be watching this live. If you didn't, you can head over there right now and watch the replay if you like. Just go to facebook.com slash Israel Anderson Official. All of my social media links you can find very easily on my website, israelanderson.com. Now, this is now a podcast. You can find us on SoundCloud, on YouTube. You can find it on an actual podcast. If you're looking for the RSS feed, I've made it very simple for you. It's israelanderson.com slash pod, P-O-D, not podcast, just pod. And that will redirect to the actual RSS feed, and you can enjoy them flowing into your favorite podcatcher. You, of course, can always catch them here live. Uh, I don't do them at set times because my schedule doesn't really permit that, um, but I do my best. Let's get on with it tonight. We're going to take a look at these 16 executive orders that Donald Trump has signed in his first eight days as President of the United States. And first, we're going to actually re-examine that statement. Because if you look out there in the media with the executive orders that were signed today, they total 16 different executive orders, but they're not. They're not. And the thing I like about Donald Trump, I wouldn't say more than anything, but it certainly is right up there, is the level of transparency. He may be cr a little crazy on Twitter, uh, but the benefit of that is that we are experiencing the most transparent presidency ever. There's absolutely no question about that at all, which is ironic because Barack Obama, when he was campaigning in 2007-8, was going on and on about how his administration would be the most transparent administration in American history, and it turned out to be one of the most opaque administrations in American history. It was the complete diametric opposite of transparent. We didn't know what he was doing. We didn't know about executive orders. They were leaked through the media. They didn't publish them all on the White House website. This president is. Donald Trump has published these even on a Saturday. The executive orders that he signed this afternoon are up on the website. I have them in front of me right now. And we're going to take a quick squiz through some of these and break down exactly of these 16, how many are actually real executive orders. Because there's a difference between memorandums and executive orders. So actually in total, the president has only signed five executive orders since he gained office eight days ago. Five. There are 10 memos and there is one proclamation, which is really just a memo, but it's a little bit of a fancier name. And the proclamation was about National School Choice Week. Now, let's take a quick look at each of these. We're not going to go through them. That would take several hours. We're going to keep this within our 20-minute time frame here. But let's just start with these five executive orders. And we'll start with number one. Number one was the executive order minimizing the economic burden of the Patient Protection and the Affordable Care Act pending repeal. Now, before I get into this, actually, there's an important thing I should say, and I've looked through all of these executive orders, including the one that was signed today, and every single one does not create new law. It does not create new legislation. This is not overreach. It's a new president. The media absolutely hates the guy. And look, I don't like some of the things he's been doing. We're going to get into that in just a second here. Uh, I will not carry, I've said this many times, I will not carry the water for Donald Trump nor anyone else. I call everybody out when I think they're being consistent, whether that's Dr. Ron Paul or whether that's Donald Trump. But none of these executive orders create law, not a single one of them. Every single one throughout the entire order, and the beauty here is you can just go onto the White House website and fact check me, and you can see for yourself 
that they don't create law. In fact, in each clause of these executive orders, it makes it crystal clear that you are to obey the existing law. It's very exciting that we don't actually have overreach right now. It's very interesting. Okay, so the first one, executive order minimizing the economic burden of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act pending repeal. Again, it you know there's a lot of meat to it, but the more the most exciting things there's two really exciting things about this executive order. Uh, number one, it means anybody that applies for a waiver is going to get it. Number two, it's uh, the president is informing the federal agencies that when any decision comes between favoring the government or favoring the people, it must always favor the people. This is something Judge Andrew Napolitano, my hero, uh, wrote an article about. I talked about it the day before that. This is incredibly original. This is very exciting to see a president put into an executive order to all federal agencies involved in the Patient Protection Act or the Affordable Care Act that if there is any discrepancy, if there is any uh, conflict between, you know, do we, do we do this or do we not do this for uh, the individual, the answer is you do it for the individual. You put the people before the government. Uh, you name me another president that has spoken like this before. I think it's brilliant. Okay, next. Uh, second executive order, January 24. Executive order expediting environmental reviews and approvals for high-priority infrastructure projects. And this has got to do with the Dakota Access Pipeline. There's a, there's, it's just so, you know, the, the media out there will jump to radical conclusions. And I've... I've got a friend who's actually been out there. Hi, Sam, uh, who actually went out and joined the protest for a while at the Dakota Access Pipeline, uh, where it's running through the Indian Reservation, or kind of, not really, but kind of. And, you know, I'm very conflicted on this issue. I'm conflicted because um, Americans committed genocide against the native people of this land. And as an immigrant, you know, I didn't grow up in the bubble. And it offends me that that occurred. Unfortunately, though, this kind of thing has happened all throughout history. It's the, it's the history of civilization, period, where people have moved into areas and take... It's been a survival of the fittest for a long, long time. Anyway, I don't, I don't exactly like it. I kind of have a little thing for, the, for natives. I, I come from New Zealand. Uh, we have the native Maori population... We learned some Maori in school, um, and Maori culture is very, very much a part of New Zealand's culture. Um, Indian culture it doesn't really play any role in American culture. It's, it's forgotten, and it's so rich in culture. It's disappointing to me. I think that it's, uh, it's a shame. And then I, I hear the flip side where, you know, apparently the tribe had all these agreements in place, and then they realized, wait, well, we could, we want more money. And so they said no and started putting up barricades and wanted to renegotiate deals that they had already negotiated for many, many years and agreed upon. Uh, so I don't know. It's hard. You know, I don't want to be that person that has a strong opinion either way. There's a lot of issues in life where I think it's more important to just say, I don't know. I don't know. It's hard. It's tough, right? It's a tough one. Anyway, that's what that was. And this order does not, absolutely does not, um, force through uh, the completion of the pipeline. And that's what everybody is saying. But if you go and read the executive order, it doesn't say that at all. It says that this must be reviewed, and it must be reviewed exceptionally expeditiously. In other words, get your ass into gear and make sure that the whole approval process is reviewed and if it should go through, then approve it immediately. If it shouldn't, then you know we, it needs to be readdressed and new negotiations occur. Um, this is all there in the executive order, but people just choose to ignore it. Um, January 25, executive order enhancing public safety in the interior of the United States. This is about bu building the wall. And again, as you know, some media has uh, spoken out, the law 
to build the wall already exists. It was signed into law in 2006, uh, was passed by a bunch of Democrats, and it was never actually followed through on. And so this executive order simply says, follow through on the damn law and create the structure to secure the border. I don't, you know, if you're going to criticize the president, go ahead. I think that he's, um, he's the president. You, you have an absolute right, um, not a privilege. You have a right to criticize the president, and you should. I don't want anyone shrinking back from that. But if you're going to criticize, then make sure your criticism is valid. Don't just criticize because you don't like his orange face and hair. I mean, that, that's ridiculous. Criticize him because you've looked at the issues. You've, you've investigated the issue. You haven't just learned from the media. My libertarian peers, this is what they do, right? They will look at, they, they will bash the mainstream media whenever they're talking about anything that is against our philosophy of liberty or, or against any of the people, you know, the celebritarians uh, in the movement. If they attack Rand Paul, then we're going to jump on them. If they attack Ron Paul, we're going to jump on them. But when they attack Donald Trump, we don't jump on them. We agree with them and we cheer them on. And that's a complete lack of objectivity right there. Right? So we know how evil the mainstream media can be, and yet we pick and choose when we want to listen to the mainstream media or criticize the mainstream media. You know, it, it, it can get a little confusing. Um uh, another executive order, January 25 as well, uh, which is also about border security and immigration enforcement improvements. Um, and then today, an executive order, which is an ethics commitment by executive branch appointees. If you're a White House official, you must now agree as part of your job that you will be forbidden from performing lobbying duties for foreign governments lobbying the United States government. And this is exciting. This is all about draining the swamp. This is about removing corruption. And uh, I mean, I can't fault that. I think that's one of the best executive orders he signed yet. Well, I think that the Affordable Care Act one is probably better. But five, not 16, five executive orders. Now let's take a look at the memorandums. Okay, and I'm just going to read off some of the titles here. Again, you know, you can just go on the White House website and you see all these, all right? So you'll find them um, in, if you go to the briefing room menu item, and then you go over to uh, statements and, oh no, sorry, presidential actions, and then you will see them broken down into executive orders, presidential memoranda, proclamations, and related OMB material. And this is going to continue to grow. We've never seen this level of transparency. It's really fascinating. All right, so I'm not even going to read these out. There's a whole bunch of memorandums, um, memorandums for the heads of executive departments and agencies. That's basically just about, you know, his um, cabinet appointees. Uh, pre presidential memorandum regarding the hiring freeze. So again, he's just informing the federal agencies, no more hiring. Only the military can hire new personnel right now, which is fantastic. And I remember all of my libertarian peers arguing with me, saying, he'll never do that. That's just a campaign promise. It's, it's BS. It'll never happen. Well, there it is. Um, I mean, w which is going to be the story that I'm going to be saying for the next eight years, right? They were telling me that, you know, he that was just a load of BS. It's just campaign rhetoric and wasn't going to get done. And yet there, it's all being done. I mean, isn't it amazing? Everybody's saying, even even Donald Trump's detractors, are admitting, well, he is just following through on what he said he'd do. Problem is, we haven't seen a president like this for a long time, and everybody criticized me and said that he's just like the rest, and I said he wasn't, and, and who believed me? A handful. Listen, this is the second American Revolution. Um, Mexico City policy, um, a memorandum regarding the construction of the Dakota Access Pipeline that's not about forcing the pipeline through. That's about if it's being built, any extensions, anything like that, it's got to use American steel and the pipe's got to be made in America. Um, I mean, you can go through and read all these. They're right there. Okay. Now, there are two from today. Presidential memorandum, plan to defeat the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria or ISIS. Now, this is asking the Pentagon to come up with 
a plan to defeat ISIS within 30 days. It's not an executive order. It's a request to the Pentagon. It's simply the president's way of making it public that he's asking the Pentagon to do this. It's just total transparency. It's really hard to fault. Uh, January 28, uh, also today, uh, on the Organization and National Security Council and Homeland Security Council. I haven't looked at that one. I don't know what it's about, to be quite honest. Um, so that's all 16. Go and take a look, though, for yourself. Go and take a look. Now, let's talk about the one that he did today, because it's the one I'm really, um, or yesterday, I'm not, not real happy with, or day before yesterday, I'm so sorry, right? On restricting, um, no, it was yesterday, I'm sorry, uh, restricting people from six or seven different countries, I've got to get my facts right here, they can no longer come into the United States, even with a visa. There were 10 people that were already on their way, they were in transit on their way to the United States, and they got detained upon arrival. They weren't permitted to uh, be allowed in. And they didn't deport them, at least somebody at Customs had some common sense. Um, or I guess Homeland Security was looking after that when Homeland Security runs customs. So they waited, detained overnight, and a district judge ordered um, about two hours, three hours ago, that these 10 people are to be released into the United States. Two of them, uh, at least from a couple of hours ago, already had been released, and the rest will be released uh, either tonight or tomorrow. So... These requests from the president do have immediate application and they also have real life implications. The people getting stuck at the border. So those of you that remember that movie by Tom Hanks where he played that um, guy who got stuck in the airport, which was based on a real story um, when a nation nation's government collapsed and this person was in transit and suddenly his passport was void. Well... We definitely need to curb the refugees from Syria. I, I really, look, I care deeply about people. Um, but letting people in from countries that are in the midst of a war, um, I mean, there's a lot of problems there with people using the refugee status to get into Europe and they've wreaked havoc in Europe. Europe has paid a tremendous price. In the United States, we've mostly dodged a bullet with that so far. And that's what the critics of this are doing, of course, uh, which is, you know, libertarians and the left. And, you know, I am critical of this as I won't carry the water for Donald Trump. I'll support him where, you know, I'll give credit where credit is due, but I'll call him out where he needs to be called out. And this is one of those occasions where he needs to be called out. I don't think this was a very sensible course of action at all. Um, and one of the um, countries on the list is Iran. And, you know, for many years, I've just had a great deal of difficulty with Iran. I don't understand the American fixation on Iran. I hear members of Congress and others in the media, um, you know, Warhawks, neocons, talking about Iran being the largest sponsor, state sponsor of terrorism in the world. And I'm like, where is your evidence of this? I mean, it seems to be like this is just a, a Frederick Goebbels style propaganda piece uh, because, you know, the whole thing about what well, if you repeat a lie often enough people will believe it. Where is Iran sponsoring state terrorism? Now, I'm not saying they're not, but I'd like to see the evidence, please. Thank you very much. You know, um, when my camera kit was stolen back in uh, 1st of July in 2015, um, I never rebuilt it. I had um, my whole camera kit. I was a pro-am, professional amateur photographer. I had a camera kit worth, um, I can't even remember now, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000. And, you know, which I had built up over 10 years. And 
I knew a lot about Iran because it was one of the places in the world where I wanted to go and photograph. You should Google Iran and then click on images and start looking at the countryside of Iran. It'll blow your mind. You know, I think a lot of Americans have this idea that Iran is going to be this, you know, place with it's just a desert with nomads and camels and all that. No, it's nothing like that. Um, I haven't seen many countries that resemble New Zealand, my home country, as much as Iran does. It is a spectacularly beautiful country. They've got ski slopes, they've got areas that are desert, they've got forests, and they've got beautiful beaches. And it's a very fascinating country. And these people are not Arabs. And most Americans think that Iran, uh, that, that they're Arabs, that Iranians are Arabs, but they're not. They're actually Persians. And they're a different race of people. And they got a very different mindset. Um, and yes, uh, Islam is definitely the predominant religion there. And they have uh, an Islamic government, but that's thanks to the United States and the implementation of the shore. So um, I just would like to see some evidence that Iran is a bad character in the world. I don't understand it. I think it seems to all come from this whole thing where Iran hates Israel and Israel hates Iran. Uh, I'm not sure we should be taking a side in that. Um, I really don't. Now, I know some Christians will get upset at that, but tough luck. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not a great supporter of Israel, sorry to tell you. Um, so don't let my name confuse you. Uh, I love Iran. I, I want to, you know, you remember years ago when um, uh, there was talks about going to war against Iran, bombing Iran, and there was a guy who, who created those I love Iran shirts. I actually went and bought one of those. Um, I just think we should be non-interventionists. Just leave people alone. The Persians have not started a war for 130 years, Right. So, and, and the wars that have gone up against them, they've crushed every single occupier that's, that's attempted. Um, they're a very patriotic country. And, you know, it's no Iraq. It's six and a half times the size of Iraq. So that's my little rant on Iran. I just think, I just think that we should be friends with Iran. If, if they truly are state sponsors of terrorism, then absolutely they should be outed. But provide the evidence. Show us where that is occurring. Quite frankly, I don't believe it. Now, if someone can show me the evidence, I'll believe it, of course. But I don't believe it right now. I've never seen the evidence. All I've seen, and you see, if you believe that, if you believe, then, then obviously you've never seen the evidence neither. Because trust me, I've been a politico for 11 years. If there was evidence, I would know about it, especially because I have somewhat of an interest in it. There isn't any evidence of it. It's just rhetoric that we see on TV day in and day out. Iran, 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 Iran. John McCain and Lindsey Graham and all these neocons that just keep ranting about Iran. It's like, what's the problem? I mean, they wanted to become a nuclear-equipped nation. I don't have a problem with that. They're a sovereign nation. If they want to develop a nuclear weapon, I'm totally okay with that. I, I really am. North Korea, on the other hand, you know, it's kind of funny, isn't it? North Korea has nuclear weapons, they're building ICBMs, right, intercontinental ballistic missiles, that um, perhaps today cannot carry a nuclear warhead because they haven't miniaturized them enough to the United States, but definitely within a few years will be able to. Why the heck are we not doing something about North Korea? Now, of course, China's right there, and China should be taking care of that. But it's almost like China is allowing North Korea to become what it is to provoke the United States to war. You know, <clears throat> we should be allies. Well, you know, I guess if we take the advice of the founders, we shouldn't be allies, but we should be friends with the Russians. I, this whole thing, I mean, just look at the way it all blew up during the election. The whole thing with Russia, it's like people like Lindsey Graham and John McCain, they're trying to restart the Cold War. It's, it's absurd. Right now, the biggest threat to America's sovereignty and independence and status in the world um, is, well, some would argue our debt, but if we're going to look at foreign nations, it's China. It's not Russia. Russia doesn't want to attack America. 
Now, we may not agree with some of the things Russia has done in Crimea and Ukraine and things like that, granted. But that doesn't or shouldn't stop us from being friends with them. We should have massive trade. We should be massive friends with Russia. We should be going to Moscow for vacation, maybe. And it's not that great of a place, probably. But, you know, there's lots of areas in Russia that would be wonderful vacation spots for Americans. And we don't go there now because we don't have that kind of relationship or rapport with Russia. I think we should. I think we should. And something that... Um, Thank you, by the way. I see these messages flowing in while I'm recording this to my inbox. I really appreciate that. Thank you. I, it shows me the first few words, and I can see that they're all very positive, and I appreciate that very much. So thank you. Um, doesn't show me who you are, so I can't read your name out. But let's start to be friends with nations. This is what Donald Trump said on the campaign trail. I made that graphic from that speech he gave on December 1st, where he made it very succinct that this old foreign policy was over. And of course, you know, everyone also with that said, no, no, it's a load of BS. No, it's not. And you're going to learn that. I hope you're already learning that, right? So we need to take care of ISIS because ISIS is this little militant group that Soros and Obama and all their, you know, John Podesta and, and the Clintons have put together to bring in their, their disruptive force in the Middle East um, to keep the industrial military industrial complex going. These are are a well-funded, trained, and, and equipped fighting force, funded and trained and equipped by Americans. They need to be taken out. We need to take out the Clintons' little, you know, provocateurs in the Middle East because that's truly who ISIS is. They need to be destroyed. They need to be gone. So, what are your thoughts on Iran? I want to go there. I want to go on vacation there. Um, I would really love to go there, especially I've got my drone now that just arrived on Wednesday, and I'm having a lot of fun with that. And uh, so, you know, as I get back on the road and start traveling the country, I'm going to be shooting a lot of drone footage, and uh, I think you're going to really enjoy some of that. Um, a lot of people put drone footage up, but most people aren't, um, big travelers like I am. So you're going to get to see stuff from all over the place. It's going to be a lot of fun. But I'd like to take my drone over to Iran and shoot some of the beautiful landscapes that they have over there. It's just absolutely amazing. Now, if they really are sponsoring state terror, okay, well, that changes the, the dynamic. But but show me the evidence, please. Don't Don't just tell me over and over again, on CNN and MSNBC, ABC, you know, phone news. Instead, show me the evidence. I mean, show me the evidence, right? I don't think that's too much to ask. So glad you could spend your evening with me tonight. I'm going to be streaming these as much as I can. I won't always be able to do it on the Facebook page, just as um, I am right now. And perhaps you are watching it live right now. That is really great. But um, I will try to do these daily. I won't always be doing them daily. I try to do my research and provide a level of insight that I think is uncommon out there. And also because I'm not an American. I'm a New Zealand immigrant. I came here 11 years ago. I have a different perspective to someone that was born here and grew up here. And I think that's, um, I think that's a needed perspective. I think we need to hear different voices. So if you agree with that, then I'd really encourage you, please share this. Please like it. The more likes it gets, the more um, all the social media networks will begin to then share that out to more people. Um, if um, you can tag people, then, you know, you share it to your Facebook page and or your Facebook profile and tag some people. That would be terrific. Uh, if you did enjoy this, I want to do something a little bit different tonight. Um, I want to be doing this and moving more into media as my full-time deal. Um, that costs money. So if you want to buy me a cup of coffee, you can send me cash through almost any payment system that there is out there, whether it's Venmo or Square Cash or PayPal or whatever it is. If you want to send me five bucks, four bucks for a cup of coffee, um, please do that. You just need my phone number, which is very public. I've made it public for many years. Uh, if you have information for me, um, then please 
uh, give me a phone call, uh, 720-346-4471. Believe it or not, very precious few people call me, even though I've been giving my number out for about seven years now, so it seems to be working just fine. And um, Ronnie Paul, Ron Paul's older son, that's Rand Paul's brother, and Doug Weed and I are also together in a network marketing business. We've been doing it for four years, over four years now. We're very excited about it. We continue to do it. And that is what provides my income today. That's what enables me to sit on the internet all day, scouring through information, trying to make sense of it all so I can bring you something. Um, if you're interested either in these wonderful health products that we have, if you want to lose some weight, if you want to get shredded in the gym, reach out to me. I'd love to show you our catalog. Uh, if you are entrepreneurial and you want to have your hand at building passive residual income, it takes a few years to do. It's not a get-rich-quick scheme, and it's definitely not a pyramid scheme. It's not MLM. Uh, then also, give me a call on that number, 720-346-4471. Hope you've enjoyed this tonight. Thank you so much for your company, and I will see you again shortly. Bye-bye.